Hello everyone, how are we doing today? And welcome to today's video. So today we're going into the next part of chapter seven, which is on complete linkage and also calculating recombination frequency just to get us into being able to work um, genetic mapping problems. So last chapter, we talked about notation and so, for, so forth, and also talked about the difference between complete linkage and incomplete linkage. Now I wanna go talk about incomplete linkage a little bit more and how crossing over and the sort of crossover events that could occur between each. All right, let's hop into it. So here for incomplete linkage, so the percent of recombinant gametes, remember recombinant is when you get a crossover event occurring between the two chromosomes. So here, you know, you have gene A, gene B, and then here you have, you know, gene, the recessive form of each. So what's the likelihood of a crossing over event occurring between them? That would be a recombinant. It would look unlike the parent. So if you get, you know, a gene product like this, if that's a gamete, you know a recombination event occurred because it doesn't look like the parent. So it equals 0.5 times the percent meiosis with a single crossing over between the two loci. So it's when a single crossover event occurs and it, you multiply it by 0.5 because there's two loci. So half is equal is the max possible. So it's the number of recombinant gametes made by one individual. So is not half. And half, again, is equal to the max possible. So this would be, you know, 50%. If you remember in the last video, we talked about four linked genes outside of independent assortment. So for linked genes, the, the recombinants were less than 25% each. Again, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, just refer to the beginning of the last video. Uh, so less than 25% each, if they're less than 25% each, that means the max possible is 50% for the two different possible non-recombinant com combinations. So the, the next thing are double crossovers. And in the future, you might see me writing these as DXO, double crossover. Whereas a single crossing over, I sometimes write as SXO, where X stands for cross, cross over. Just quick, dirty abbreviations for it. So double crossover might occur between loci. So let's say we have our two chromosomes again. Now these genes are located a little bit further apart. So it's very possible to have a double crossover. So you could have one occur here and then one occur down here and that double crossover makes it the same. You don't ever really notice unless you have a gene in the middle. So we focus on these double crossovers. Let's say gene R is now in the middle here. So if there was a double crossover that occurred here, you would know it by that middle gene. And we can use that later to help us figure out the middle gene in a three point test cross. But if it's a double crossover just between two loci, you get non-detectable recombinants because the product is the same as the parent. Um, next up are what we do when now is when we start getting into more into linkage and these test crosses involved. So how do we test for this and so forth? We again talked about this in the last video in the percentages and the percentages are what are important here. So you take that first, you know, you had that parent, so the homozygous dominant cross the heterozygous form and that all yields the, you know, heterozygous dihybrids. So we talked about that last chapter. Remember, you can write this as, you know, AB slash AB. So this is all in coupling or cis confirmation, but repulsion is okay, but we just focus on coupling to keep things easier here. So this can be represented like this, or again, just notation wise again, uh, remember you can also write it like this with a bar. So then you, for a test cross for linkage, you take this dihybrid here and you cross it, it's like it says right there, by the homozygous recessive one. And looking at these products, you can then figure it out by, you can then calculate the recombination frequency of the products and see kind of how far apart these genes are located from each other based on that recombination frequency. So super, super cool technique. And you also can determine a lot about it. So let's say if it was independent assortment. So again, we talked about this last video, but just as a reminder, remember if it was independent assortment, everything would be 25%. So these would be the, the non-recombinant then. So each of these, so this would be one parent. Again, you, you know, look at the parents again. You know, here's one parent. Here's the other parent. 
both of these look like the parents, which means they are the non-recombinants. There'd be a 25% chance. So this is independent assortment again. Whereas the recombinants, again, if it's independent assortment, they'd be 25%, but they don't look like the parents. And they would look like this. So this would be one form, and then this would be other form. I'm not going to write this out because... You know, that's you can do a Mendelian cross to figure this out to see what the other um, forms are. But again, here we have, you know, this is one recombinant and then this is the other recombinant where they don't look like the parents. Now, what if it's complete linkage? Remember, we also defined complete linkage last chapter. If it's complete linkage, it's only going to be the non recombinant. So these things are linked so close together, they're never going to separate. So it's 50 percent, you know, one non recombinant and 50 percent the other non-recombinant so there'd be no there'd be no recombinants here uh only non-recombinants would be present and 50 percent each you don't have any chance unless there's something really random that happens for any recombinants to form now the big picture here is if it's incomplete linkage so this one remember there'd be greater than 50 percent non-recombinants so greater than 50% here, and these are the two non-recombinants. I'll keep them green to keep them consistent. And again, that's because there's a higher chance because the genes are linked. However, there could be crossing over events that unlink them. So that means the rest would be less than 50%. So less than 50% then would be the recombinants. And again, the, you can look at these percents then based on the recombination frequency to help you determine what the two loci, what are going on at the two loci. Are they linked? Are they complete linked? Or, or are they following independent assortment? And that can give you an idea of where they might be located on a particular chromosome. So a lot of information can be taken from this little bit of data right here. So the best way to show this is by looking at an example. So recombination frequency is equal to the, so it's the percent of recombinant progeny is equal to the number of recombinant offspring divided by the total number of offspring. So let's check an example. So example here, um, fur can either be pink or purple. So pink is dominant, purple is recessive, and the skin can be rough skin or smooth skin. Rough is dominant, smooth is recessive. Here we have our parent cross, you form your F1 generation, and then here you do your test cross. So boom, done. Um, what are our parents here? So you know, homo heterozygous right here would be pink, rough skin, and the recessive form would be purple, smooth skin. And I like to write out my non-recombinants because then I know what the parents are supposed to look like when I'm looking at what the offspring are. So if we're looking at the offspring, then we can label the non-recombinants. So pink, rough, pink, rough. So, you know, 80, pink, rough, non-recombinants, purple, smooth, and then here's the other. Uh, non-recombinant. Then you can label the recombinants, whereas 12 pink smooth would be a recombinant form and nine purple rough would be the other recombinant form. So there, that's important to know because here our equation is the number of recombinant offspring. So you're focused on the red ones here divided by the total number of offspring. So let's, you know, calculate this recombination frequency then. So if we're looking at this recombination frequency, it's just the number of recombinant offspring, so 12 plus 9, divided by the total, which is a summation of all of them. So this is equal to 0 0.119, and to express that as a percent, you times it by 100, so that's 11.9% recombination frequency between these two genes. Uh, so that tells so look, they're less than 50%, that's what you want. The closer this gets to 50%, the higher the chance that they assort independently. So if these numbers were closer to the 75 and the 80 here, that would automatically start telling me they're assorting independently because think, the closer they get to a 25% chance at each roughly, that's when you get independent assortment. And that's where we also start leading into the next video we're gonna go over where we can start talking about chi-square analysis. Do these results match your expected? Does your outcome match your expected? And you can compare that by determining, so say something's 45% recombination frequency. You can't be 100% sure that that's independent assortment or those genes are linked. 
So you can use the chi-square analysis to really further uh, dive into that to see if they are linked or follow independent assortment. That's the next video. That's a whole separate video going over that. Um, it deserves a separate video. So one other little example here, I want to show it work backwards because, you know, working forward is easy, you know, for the most part. You fully understand it if you can take a problem and work backwards. We'll do the same thing with three-point test crosses in a later video. Okay, so working backward here, now we're comparing a dominant uh, warty, where recessive smooth, uh, and dominant dull and recessive glossy. We have our, you know, our test cross here. That's what that's represented by. Remember, if you want to write that out differently, you can write it like this. So this would mean the same thing. Or, you know, you can write it the old-fashioned way, like this. And th these are good to start writing down because it helps you see everything better. And then you can also write them out. So this one, you know, is warty doll. And this one would be smooth glossy. And now you know what your non-recombinants should be. So let's look at this problem. So our recombination frequency is 15%. And the expected number of progeny, well, the expected progeny, we want to figure out the expected progeny out of 200 total. We can we have the information we need to figure this out. So here, if we you know get rid of the frac the percentage, it's just 0.16. So recombination frequency is 0.16. Now remember that is equal to the number of recombinants over the total. And here we're calling our total 200. So you can solve this for the number of recombinants. So number of recombinants, so you take 200 times 0.16 is equal to 32. So we know we have 32 recombinants. So what are our recombinants? So if our parents are warty, dull, and smooth, glossy, we know our rec recombinants have to be warty, glossy, and dull, smooth, or um, smooth, dull. And if we write uh, the alleles out for this, they of course would look like this. So this would be warty dulcy, uh, dulcy, glossy, and this would be smooth dull. And now how many of each are there? So number of recombinants, this is total. Remember, there are two different sets of recombinants here. So it'd be 16 for each. So 16 recombinants for each. Boom. That's our expected number of recombinants out of 200 total based on a recombination frequency of 16%. And we can take this one step further now and we can look at the non-recombinants and calculate how many of those there should be. So for the non-recombinants, it's pretty simple. If there's 32 recombinants out of 200, you take 200 minus 32. That's the number of non-recombinants. And if they are linked, this number should be a larger number. So this is actually equal to a 168. And again, our non-recombinants are right up here. We already wrote them out. And that's the benefit of writing it all out. It makes it so, you know, you don't screw up as much at the end. So here, just write them out one more time. How many of each of these do you have? Remember, this is for both. So you divide that by two, and then you have 84 non-recombinants for each. So there, that's your answer. And that's, so that's not too bad. It's just working backwards helps you think about it differently. It helps you realize this needs to be divided by two and so forth. So that's why I like to work some of these problems backwards. And then this leads us now into the next video, which will be on chi-square analysis to determine if these numbers suggest that it's independent assortment or if the genes are linked. Really, really fun way. We do something called a contingencies table, but we'll wait for next time to not overwhelm you today. All right. Again, that's all I have for today. Hope you all have a great rest of your day. Let me know if you have any questions and bye-bye.